Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our program today on two little known mills that will be presented by um, Goshenhofen historian Bob Wood. Bob has given a number of programs here, and it's I feel like I always learn something um, after when Bob does a presentation. Our next program in November, our brown bag, is uh, November 13th, and it's entitled Schwenkfeld 101, and it's being given by Dave Lutz, who's the Director of Emeritus here. Um, because of some schedule conflicts, Dave is going to be presenting that via Zoom. And you can watch it on the screen here, or if you have internet at home, you can get the link to watch it at home. Um, we apologize for that conflict, but Dave will be with us, but via Zoom. Um, and Bob, excuse me. Not a speaker. It's still a mic problem, so just hold on a moment, please. Say something. Can you hear in the back? Did you hear our earlier announcement about November's program? Can you hear me? Can you hear in the back? Okay. 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 I'll just repeat that a little. <clears throat> Um, I'll just repeat that our next program will be November 13th, and it will be via Zoom that you can watch here or have the link to watch at home. And that will be by Dave Woods and entitled Schwenkfeld 101, and it's about the early beginnings of the Schwenkfelder Church, and Dave is, I think, is a very good person to be um, doing that program. But now I'm um, very happy to welcome Bob Wood talking on Two little known mills. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for coming out. It's nice to see such a large group. And I'm happy to be here. I hope you are too. I hope you learn something or at least find it interesting. So, um, okay. Clover seed mills of southeastern Pennsylvania, exceedingly rare. And uh, there are very few and for a short period of time. So, go ahead. Sorry again. We gotta let's see if we can get that out of the way. Okay, should disappear at some point. That's <laughs> okay, good enough. Um, the clover seed mills and the other my other topic today is oil mills. Um, they were pretty much gone by the Civil War as were many of these little cottage industry mills. If, let's say, in 1825, you went to the village store to buy something, anything, fabric, shoes, this or that. Ah. <laughs> fabric or shoes or, or this or that, anything, probably it would have been made locally, close to home, by village craftsmen or artisans. Go 50 years later, let's say 1875, and almost guaranteed it would have been made at a distance and brought in by rail. And rail and the Industrial Revolution changed everything, much the way the computer changed things today. Of course, then it just changed the external thing. The computer changed our brains, but uh, that uh, it's a similar or a similar revolution. How many of these little cottage industry mills hung on? I'm talking like the tanner, the harness maker, the shoemaker. Blacksmiths, of course, went, kept on. Blacksmiths morphed into garages, auto mill garages. They kept on going for a longer period of time. But uh, everything just kind of drifted away there during the Industrial Revolution. It was all made possible by rails. So there we are. Okay. Clover seed mills of southeastern Pennsylvania. Oh, that's <laughs> just stand here. Oh, I know. Okay. Now we seem there. We go. Oh, we go. Say, oh, the first one seems to always stick. Okay. Um, 
Of clover seed mills, we know nothing. Uh, Schwankfelder here has one photo. That is a clover seed mill, or uh, it was. Uh, it's got a new roof. It's being apparently used for a barn now. You can see, um, you can see in here, there's hay stacked. And any, if it's a photograph, it would have been, clover seed mills would have been gone a good 50, 60, 70 years before there were photographs. But what you see down here in the lower right corner is the, uh, the mill race going in, the head race, uh, didn't have much water. That is, here, didn't take much water. Probably that looks like it had an overshot water wheel. And uh, that's what I have for an image of a clover mill. There's not much. Here's a curious thing. Uh, a bird cell clover holler um, from, uh, um, uh, anyway, it's 1855. This I just lifted offline. I think it's interesting because of the mistakes in it. Um, I, I lifted this off a line and I wish that would go away. Go oh, back. Huh? Oh. That would be better. And then if you keep your this so this is not on the screen, that's oh. down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, there's a curiosity. A clover holler. 1855, that's early. Well, <laughs> His machine both removed the holes from the clover, removed the seeds from the holes, and cleared the seeds so they could be used or sold for animal feed. What? Clover seed was not used for animal feed or as a soil nutrient. Well, clover improved the soil, but it was hardly a nutrient. Until the uh, mid 18th century, Wait a minute, 18th century, that would be 1750. This work was done by hand and by animal power requiring, no, that's not right. That so much for the internet and the history things. Now there, there is a contraption. Uh, furthermore, I don't see how it was powered. Uh, 1855, it must have been a horse treadmill. There must have been a large wheel on the other side hooked with a belt to a horse treadmill, which certainly wasn't powered by hand. I don't think there were many of these made or used. Um, it's just a curiosity, a contraption of a clover hauler. So now, um, sometime back, I was leading a tour in a nearby museum and I was going on about clover seed and cleaning clover seed and clover this and clover that. And a guy that was uh, in the tour, they said, what, what did, they, did they eat the seed? And like, uh, no, let's back up. <laughs> uh, let's back up. Uh, no, they didn't eat the seed. Um, I'll give a little tutorial here for just a few minutes on clover. Red clover was introduced into England from Flanders in 1633 and arrived in Pennsylvania with the early Anglo immigrants, that means English immigrants. In addition to being among the best forage crops, clover increased the fertility of the soil far more than just fallow, and yet it added nitrogen to the soil. But it's the best forage crop. It's clover, everything likes clover. You know the phrase, in the clover? Well, if you if a horse was in the clover or a cow was in the clover, they were happy. Clover was the best. It was the tastiest, I guess, and it was the most nutritious. It was high in protein. Clover was the best. The downside to it was that uh, plants were small. Uh, if you're cu cl cutting clover for forage, you didn't get much. Um, but anyway, so clover was desirable. In 1685, now that's, that's early, a Quaker farmer in Philadelphia wrote to William Penn that William Penn was only here for a few years, 1683 to 1685, that he had sowed great and small clover with a little old grass seed for trial, and it grows exceedingly. And at first, red clover was grown mainly on drained or irrigated meadows. Clover and Timothy grass 
are the only species that are cultivated in our drained meadows, wrote Lewis Evans in 1754. So that's going back there. Yeah, in 1754, uh, in the early colonial days around here, they did not grow hay as a, uh, in fields as a field crop the way they did in the later times and later years. That the, the uh, hay, what they cut off, dried, took in the barn for winter forage for the cows was meadow grass. It was grown in floodplains or lowlands or marshy areas, and it's a wild grass that grew here luxuriously and abundantly on its own. It was later on that they started growing hay in fields. Uh, anyway, they irrigated these meadows commonly. They dam up the stream, overflow the water through little channels, and irrigate the meadows in the summer so they give more uh, meadow grass and hay. An enormous amount of work, well, as was everything in those days. Mowing clover for winter fodder, Wisconsin. I don't know, something off the internet. Okay. There is the dried red clover blossom. When it dries, there are tiny little seeds in there, and it's covered with a leathery, tough outer shell. And therein lies the problem. You've got to thresh it, and you've got to hull it. The red clover was not grown generally until after the revolution. Seed was scarce, expensive, and often poor. We are fast getting into clover, wrote William Logan in 1755, but are at a loss for seed that is good. What we have is red and chiefly comes from England. Another hindrance to clover, clover culture not realized at the time was soil acidity. Now they realized that quite by chance. Uh, the story goes that at some place they were mining and processing gypsum, which is alkaline, almost like lime. And uh, they noticed wherever the gypsum hit the ground, the grass and clover grew luxuriously. And they said, hmm, okay, let's spread a little on this field and see what happens. Uh, everything loved it. It, it uh, uh, neutralizes or makes alkaline acidic soil. Now, if you're in limestone, limestone regions like most of Berks County or Ole Valley, that has plenty of limestone and that soil is wonderful and it doesn't need any sweetening or, or being made more uh, with higher pH. But on red shale, like we have in my place, or what we generally have around here, on red shale, it's acid. The soil is acidic and to get good crops, you need to add lime and limestone, uh, limestone powder. Um, the farmer that farm mine put on, uh, it was, um, um, quarry dust, uh, quarry crushing limestone in the crushed stone, it gives dust. They collect the dust and they put that on the fields. Works wonderfully. Anyway, moving right along. After the revolution, clover seed production increased rapidly. A York newspaper for 1792 carried this advertisement. The farmers who would wish to improve their land and stock and put money in their purses by cultivating that valuable new article, clover, may be supplied with seed by applying to the subscriber. By 1800, clover was being grown throughout the region, generally sowed in the chaff on frozen ground in the sign of cancer of the crab. So, so in the chaff, that is you'd thresh it so the seed was liberated from that tough pod, but you wouldn't necessarily clean it and get the, the holes out of it. You just take the whole thing and sow it in the ground by hand the way you sowed other grain. And it was done when the ground was frozen because as you know, cr frozen ground gets crunchy. And the, you know it, it, it's crunchy. And you sow the seed on there with the idea and the sign of cancer of the crab because the crab claw would get it and pull it down. And uh, when it thawed, of course, it would be covered a little bit with a little bit thin layer of soil. And there we go, it's seeded. That was, that was the custom. Now, did they all do this? I don't know. I also put that picture there just, just for just for just for so as the Dutchman says. See, they're using flails. They didn't do that that way. That's all wrong. Um, around maybe they did somewhere. I don't know. But around here, those flails were never wailed overhand like a sledgehammer. They were, in fact, hardly going. The, the handle of the fl flail went about the waist height 
and you flipped it around, the club part of it, you flipped it around. It was like a thump, 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 thump. And you didn't wail it overhand like a sledgehammer. Maybe it is somewhere, but not around here. There, in fact, is a flail. On the left is the handle with a swivel, and on the right is the club part. According to Kaiser, those that's the proper, that's an original proper leather binding, uh, the way it was put on and knotted. Uh, it's in the Goshenhofen Museum. That's very rare. Uh, it's probably the only one, you know, in the universe with the original bindings. And of course, it's a swivel because you need that swivel. If you're flipping it around, uh, you need that swivel. Okay. Most every farm had a fanning mill used to separate chaff from grain by generating the devil's wind. Anything that you threshed on the thresh floor, wheat, rye, even oats, barley, any cereal grain, uh, you'd clean it, you'd get the chaff and stuff out of the grain with a fanning mill in the barn. Um, there was a crank, here, like here, there's a crank, you turn the crank, it would work with a fan and you'd blow the, the heavier seed. Well, here's the schematic, the devil's wind. Cranking the fanning mill produced an airstream to blow chaff and holes up and away while the heavier seed fell through screens to be collected below. Every farm had one of those. I burned the one on our farm in, in 1970. They were everywhere, they were worthless. You take them to auction, there would be no bids. And uh, well, they're not all everywhere anymore. But um, so that's fanning mill. Now, cleaning seed for market, clover mills. Now, getting to the point of the story. Um, there were not many clover mills. This is the inside of Kriebel's book, a very fine, very nice book, published by Schwankfelder. Um, I have my copy up here. Um, the town of some Hosensack Valley mills. And this is inside the front cover. There's a little map. Now, these all these mills did not exist at the same time, of course, but on the, on the Hosensack Creek in the Hosensack Valley, which is about mm, three miles west of where we are now, off, off of Route 29, um, there's a, uh, you'll notice, I wish I had my laser pointer, but there, there was grist mills, fulling mills that dealt with uh, um, wool cloth, powder mills, blasting powder, Metzger oil mill, which we'll get to, grist mill, Trump's oil mill, well, Powder Valley, <laughs> Powder Valley Grist Mill, the Eagles uh, Fulling Mill, the, all along these creeks, if it had a nice flow in the creek, there were mill after mill after mill after mill. And right here is Krause's Clover Mill. So there was that one. On the rest of the map, there weren't any, no clover mills. Um, oil mills galore, and every other kind of mill, but no clover mills. I feel one other, this is a 1848 Atlas of Montgomery County. And there's Heckler's Clover Mill in South of Township by some creek. Um, those are the only two mills that I, location of, of clover mills that I found. Like I said, they're exceedingly rare. Clover mills, on the design and working details, I have found almost nothing locally. No drawings, no sketches, no details. They existed for a few decades about 200 years ago. However, we have some descriptions. Uh, this, these descriptions come off of Google Books. These are free PDFs online. There's uh, three, the Farmer's Cabinet, the Farmer's Register, and the American Farmer. Those were 19th century. Those were not Pennsylvania, Dutch, or local. Those were sort of national, and they were like magazines, and they would be of interest to farmers. Anyway, when grown for its seed, this most of this material I have in the next few slides comes from one of those. When grown for seed, the mature clover blossoms were harvested with a clover header. The tops of the dry clover were traditionally trodden by horses on the threshing floor of the barn or flailed by hand to separate the seed from the pod. In the 1820s, millers in the premier clover growing area of Chester, Lancaster and Montgomery counties were pioneering the cleaning of clover seed by water-powered mills. Okay, 
there is a clover reaper. You pushed it along like a lawnmower, I guess, in the field. And here, in fact, is one. It's in the Mercer Museum in Doylestown. Um, there's, there's fingers there in the bottom that the, the clover, they'd kind of catch the clover blossom and take it up and it would pop off. And the top here is actually up in here. It's actually a box. This picture doesn't show it well, but there's a box. And these, these fingers were here. The clover would pop the, the uh, heads off the clover, the dried heads. They go back in the box, maybe pull them back in the box from that scraper. And, uh, and they would be collected there in the box. That's the only one of these that I know. There may be more in the world somewhere, but that's back in the Mercer Museum. It's also in the Gosh and Hoppen Museum. That's a clover cradle. They also are very rare. Um, I don't see how that worked unless you were working in your knees, which I doubt. Um, but there's no way to, to handle that. And the, I mean, the, the line we have on it is it's a clover cradle or a clover header or a clover scythe. Uh, now, some sources say it just topped the seed pods and there was a linen uh, bag or cloth on those cradle uh, fingers. Or maybe they just, um, I don't think they were cutting it as forage because the blade is not a scythe blade. It's a piece of tin and welded onto the top there is a piece of nail rod. And um, they weren't going to cut much with that because it's not a scythe blade. It's a clover header, I think. Uh, but honestly, handling it and with the angle of the blade is what you see, still you, I don't see how they work it unless they're working on their knees, which is doubtful, but I don't know, but there it is. Um, it is much the best to cut the dried blossoms with a cradle, laying all of it in double swaths and securing the heads from falling through by fing the fingers by stitching a piece of linen cloth upon them. Farmer's Register, 1838. But as it regards ease and facility to the farmer, the mills are preferred. That is preferred to hand threshing and horse treading. He has only to thresh or tread it off and separate the chaff and pods completely from the straw and the stalks and send it to the mill. He received the seed fit for the market by paying the toll of one-tenth to the miller for his labor. 1839. Now, this is a way of, of uh, here's grist mill. Um, this is, but the bottom of the picture is obscured, but whatever. Um, they're, they're, they're dressing millstones on a, on a grist mill. The bedstone stays, uh, this, the guy on the left is of course dressing the bedstone. Actually he's leveling it. And the guy up there is, is uh, dressing the grooves of the millstone. That, of course, is the top runner stone. It's upside down there. Every mill had a, a, a crane uh, with which you lifted that millstone off. And that one probably weighs well, well over a ton. And uh, those holes on either side are where a yoke fit in. You lift it up, flip it around, turn it grooves down onto the bedstone. And that was the way that fit it together. And the, uh, grist mills, all, all grist mills, like all mills, were um, top runners. The bedstone stood still and the top runner spun. Clover mills were the opposite. There's uh, clover mill stones. They're the only ones in the, the only photo in existence that I know of comes from Smithsonian. Um, the clover mills were bottom runners. On the on the this side here, this is the top stone. It has these and it grooves once you have to probably get it off in order to dress the bottom runner stone, which is this one. Um, it's hard to see, but it actually comes up to a cone. And you stuff the uh, the clover blossoms down here in the top and the bottom runner uh, with uh, fresh and out and it's fun. Uh, there's little grooves over here and then uh, it would break out the, uh, it would grind them, grind up the, uh, the tough leathery coating on the clover blossom. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Beth. All right. So 
those that's a clover millstone, probably the only ones that I know of in existence. Farm runner. Uh, well, the mill and millstones, quote, well adjusted to their business, the faces of the bedstone, true and level, the runner true also, and a large eye or hole in the center, and well hollowed to receive the soft chaffy substance readily, and a true face of seven or eight inches on the outer skirt or circumference to cause friction enough to do the business without any furrows in either of them, but picked rough. Well, this one had little furrows. The trick of it was to thresh it without crushing the seed. Uh, as the seed passes from the stones, it's fanned, and what is shed out passes off through a screen or a sieve, and the light dusty part of the chaff is blown out at a window. The remaining heavier chaff that has seed yet remaining is raised by elevators and falls by the stone in order to go through again. And this is done by water power and is continually going on with regularity until the parcel more or less becomes finished. Okay. Let's skip that guy. Um, um, in order to save a little time, let's we'll skip that one too. Um, the elevator delivers the seed into the first fan falling on the shoe or coarse riddle that receives it and takes all the straw out, leaving nothing to pass through more than is necessary to be turned back to the stones again and so on. I'll just summarize this. It's complicated. Um, this, the, the, the clover mill was no simple thing. And importantly, I think you could not use the mill or the water power for any other purpose. Many times, many times a grist mill was also a sawmill and they could use the power for other things. But the clover mill seems to be dedicated only to clover and they would have business in the fall and the winter. Uh, so I don't know. Okay, Johannes Markley's account book. He was a, a Fegelsville blacksmith. And the top one there, it says, this one up there says, a half bushel of clover seed, seven shillings, sixpence. And below, a peck of clover seed, 18 shillings, nine. And that's backward, that's reverse. Because a peck is a quarter, a peck is a quarter of a bushel. So a half bushel, a peck can't be twice as much as a half bushel. They're referring to reverse. I find these uh, you know, puzzling out the uh, the old uh, German. Um, but I find many interesting things in here. Um, here's a well up here. Interesting, down there. Interest for two months for a 12 pound loan was 12 shilling fourpence. Now that's that's two months. So in a year, that would come to almost 80 shillings, 20 shillings to the pound, so that's four pounds. So in a year, he's paying four pounds of interest on a 12 shilling, on a 12 pound loan. That's almost 30%. Um, it's almost as bad as credit cards today. <laughs> um, so anyway, an axe, an axe, and so on. Hmm. Uh, Whoops, yes. Move the, okay, move the cursor up a little bit. Move the, move the cursor down. Whoop. Well, beside the point, that's the last slide. <laughs> and, and that's that's what I have so far on Clover. So uh, now the other half, I rushed along to get through. The other half goes to oil mills, which uh, may be of uh, uh, more interest than Clover mills. But Clover mills were very rare. I found two and complicated and ran for a short period of time. And like all other cottage industries around here, um, were brushed aside by the Industrial Revolution and rails. Um, so clover, like other things in commodities, farm commodities and so on, became, became industrial products. So. 
Oops, I can go ahead. I cannot get, and I've had this problem with this before. I cannot seem to get it. Well, we'll make do. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. There you go. Linseed oil mills in Germanic, Pennsylvania, 1750 to 1850. By the Civil War, flax was generally not grown anymore. You went to the store and bought cotton cloth, which was made on, on, uh, on power looms in the South. There was a brief recurrence, resurgence of flax during the Civil War because uh, we didn't have the Southern cotton. Cotton doesn't grow around here. And during the Civil War, um, flax was grown again. And any memories of old people back around the turn of the century of, of flax fields, it was the brief resurgence of it during the Civil War that they remembered, I think. <clears throat> oh, Beth. It won't advance. Okay, it's advancing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, flax, is co flax cultivation goes all the way back. Evidence of flax culture has been traced back to the Neolithic age, 12,000 years ago. In sites, they find re residue evidence of flax. We'll skip that one. If you want to know about flax processing, this is there's one publication that has it's excellent. It has it all. Flax processing in Pennsylvania from seed to fiber by Eric, by Garrett and Kaiser. Um, that is the the absolute best. And Pennsylvania Folk Life is a is a common uh, <clears throat> publication. I'm sure that they they have it here. We have many oil mills in this province, it being a great country for flax, said Benjamin Franklin in 1747. So that's going back there. Now those little round balls are the, are the uh, flax seeds. Uh, there's four seeds in each little ball. Flax was sown for fiber, was planted thickly, 80 to 160 pounds of seed to the acre. So it would grow crowded, hence tall and slender without side branches and the thickness tended to choke out weeds. Flax was often planted in an acre of the oats field as both were planted about the same time, the first two weeks of April and harvested at the same time after grain harvest. And grain harvest is usually mid-July. Flax was extremely labor intensive. In the Germanic regions, women were much involved in all aspects of linen culture, except plowing and sewing. Yeah, the men are there taking their ease under a tree while the women are, are bundling the flax. There were 22 separate operations between pulling the stalks and taking yarn to the weaver. It was very labor intensive. Flax was pulled rather than cut, so as not to lose any of the fiber. The roots were cut off later. Now those are green. Flax for seed and so forth, was let to get dry like that. A flax bundle with original rye straw tied after the seed pods were threshed off. I wonder why you bundle it after the seed was threshed off. Well, you, you bundle it to bring it in from the field and then you thresh the seeds off and I don't know. The twine is a later edition by Schwankfelder Heritage Center. So that is in the collection here somewhere. In the barn on the thresh floor, the dried bundles were opened and the seed pods oriented toward the center aisle where a thresher used a squared wood block shattering the pods and releasing the seeds. Curiously, for some reason, the devil was associated with flax here we see him escaping or being driven off with the smoke. Devil's flax, a common European perennial having showy yellow and orange flowers, a naturalized weed in North America. Now it's kind of it's kind of hard to see. I'm going to step away from aside from the microphone a second, but he's right there. <laughs> he's escaping. There's a, a, a flax seed uh, crusher that's at the Goschenhofen Museum. Um, I don't know why it had the handle, it's such a funny angle, but that's the way they did. Um, you just, you, you'd stomp that wooden stomper down 
and uh, crush the seeds open so you liberate the seeds from the holes. Another way to do that would rippling the flax. Well, rippling the flax seed uh, to get this to get the uh, the uh, the little flax balls that have the seed to get them off of the stems called rippling, and you just pulled it through those spikes and, and it popped them off. There's one in the museum. It's a flax ripple. It's called. There's the one on a handle. It's a curious thing. Um, I don't know what the purpose of that was. You could. Uh, you could, and somebody could hang on to that, and somebody else could, could could ripple, could pull the flax through, but you'd have to have, do it in the barn or something because the seed pods would be going all over the place. But nevertheless, it's some some sort of flax ripple, flax ripple. And two, after threshing, the seed was mixed with the hulls and stems, which were then separated by the fat fanning mill. As we saw before, the devil's wind cranking the fanning mill produced an air stream to blow chaff and holes up and away, while the heavier seed fell through the screens to be collected below and collected in the box, which you can take out, and there you are. Linseed oil was used for making paints and putty as a drying agent for printer's ink, a wood preservative, and finish for gun stocks and fine furniture. The oil was also burned in lamps and was used as a lubricant and as an ingredient in many medicines. And indeed, we, we eat flax oil and flaxseed oil today. According to The Best Poor Man's Country, it's a very fine book, Lancaster County had five oil mills by 1759. By 1810, Berks County had 25 mills, Montgomery 24 and York 22. Additionally, Fletcher in Pennsylvania Agriculture and Country Life in 1640 to 1840 notes, Benjamin Franklin reported that over 70,000 bushels of flax seeds were exported from the Port of Philadelphia every year. And that, I don't know, that's, that's what it said, 70,000 bushels. Um, much of it went to Ireland, fine Irish linen, they pulled the flax before it was mature and ripe. It was soft and green, and it made a softer, nicer linen cloth. But the seed was not mature. So if you did that, you had to get seed from somewhere. And here's 70,000 bushels. Uh, I it up. And that's 70,000 bushels that was exported is in addition to the bulk of it that was crushed for oil here in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Now the mills, the flax seed, you cleaned it, you crushed it, you roasted it, maybe, and you pressed it. And from that, you got oil and you got a, a cake, which was uh, fed to cattle. Now the seed was crushed in edge running stones. The edge runners were oil for oil or bark or hemp and powder mills. There were edge running stones, there were, there were two on an axle. And they were in a, in a track, a stone or iron, usually stone track, and they just followed each other around. The, you turn the central shaft, and um, the, 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 uh, the stones would just follow each other in the track. And the, in addition to the weight of the stone crushing it, it would also have a grinding effect because the stone would naturally want to go straight, and you're forcing it to go in an arc, and it has a, a grinding, a crushing grinding effect. Uh, this was a powder mill, but it's the same principle. There were two large, large um, um, stone millstones. Only well, they weren't stone; they're powder mills. You didn't want to, you want to be careful not to strike a spark. So I think those were iron. These were this were later. But I just included the slide because it's two stones, ro rota running, rotating in a track, driven by a central um, axle. Here's another one, something off the internet. I think that's a, that is, it's European. I think it's an olive oil crushing thing, but it shows, it clearly shows the two stones following each other around in a track. And that was how they crushed flax in a flax seed. The pair of Edgeway millstones in Gablesville, that's at the, the Gablesville mill, which is now owned by the uh, Boyertown Historical Society. An oil mill was established there in 1827. Um, 
So the two stones are there. Now, curiously, this I don't understand. They both have that square central hole for the axle. Well, they can't base it on one solid shaft because they won't, they won't, they'll fight each other. Uh, somewhere in there, if they're both in a squ that square, that square mm -hmm. axle, there has to be some sort of a break or a, uh, some, some sort of swivel operation. Anyway, they are big. I put that flashlight there to show scale and perspective. Those are much, much bigger than common millstones. Those are, those are big. But they're oil mill crushing stones. The oil mill was completed enough for our brethren to make the first linseed oil at uh, Moravian's Bethlehem, 1745. Okay, and that's flaxseed bloom. The flax. Journal of the Lancaster County Historical Society. The flaxseed was ground between two stones, six feet in diameter, and the, the grist was put into a stout bagging, pounded with heavy wooden hammers, after which it was put into a wooden box with slides. These slides were pushed together and wedged up with heavy wooden wedges. By this means, the oil was expressed, but not more than from 10 to 15 gallons could be made in a day. It was, however, a pure linseed oil. Um, this is a little schematic. This is how it worked around here. Um, you had the stamper and the release. Um, I'm going to have to step away from the microphone for a minute. Sorry. This, uh, this stamper would pound this down with wedge. The, uh, the bag of roasted seed wrapped in leather back portion of mattress here and here, one on either side. As you would pound that down, this one here, it would force out these wedges and it would put pressure on those bags and the oil that was in there would be expelled. Um, somewhere coming up, the, the, it was, there was a, the, that stamper was held in a cage, it was a log that weighed about 600 pounds and it was lifted by a, a water wheel on the axle, there was a cam. A cam is like a bump sticking out. And they would catch another bump in the log, lift it a foot or two, and then it would slip off the cam and it would drop, bang. And about that time, the next cam came around and hit it, lifted it, and bang. Lifted it and bang. And it just, you just keep going like that until all the oil was expelled. Banging down a 600, banging down a 600 pound uh, log on that wedge that would have been wedged so incredibly tightly you never could have gotten it out except there was another sample that would take this one here knock it down and that would loosen the whole thing um it, it, that was the way that was the uh, none of these of course are in existence uh this is just a, some some artist drew this but uh, that was the way they worked. Um, around here, I think it was Creeble and others noted that um, you could hear quite a distance, the banging, the stamp, bang, bang, bang of the oil mills. Um, I don't know how long they, they stamped, I guess they stamped it until there was no more oil coming out. Uh, we could take Einstein's draft book. Uh, oil exact to market, an oil sack to make. In other words, that uh, those are weaver's notes. They look like musical notes, but they're weaver's notes on how to set the loom to make an oil sack. To hold the, the uh, linseed oil would be put in the track, some water would be put in there and, and the, it would be crushed by the stones. At some point, you'd shovel it out and you and, and put it in the oil sacks, put it in the, in the, the stamper and expel the oil. That was the best. Another way to do it was to heat the oil so, so it was very hot. That was a lesser quality linseed oil, but you got more out of it. That, I put that in this one because it demonstrates or shows the axle of the water wheel turning and lifting the stamper. Now this is this is for a stamper for a mortar and pestle. 
Uh, the Moravians used those, but we've never used that type around around here in Dutchdom. So as you, as you see there, that cam would catch the, the uh, side arm on the stamper, which was a 600 pound log, and you lift it and drop it, lift it and drop it, lift it and drop it. And we can skip this too. That is, um, a, it's a seed roasting pan. They would, one way to do it was to do it cold. The other way was to heat, to heat the, um, the oil and by stirring it continuously with that contraption. Um, once again, none of these are in existence and this isn't some artist's rendition of it, but you could do it cold or you could heat it, the, the, the oil mash mix. Um, Joseph Grof had an oil mill near, near Salford Station. His account book states in 1816 and goes to about 1830, the scattered entries, and entries in the 1840s. Right from the start, he is selling large quantities of linseed oil in October 1816, November 1816, and December 1816, he records 255, 247, and 239 gallons, and 301, one half gallons to John Wetterill. That's a total of 1,042 and a half gallons of linseed oil in three months to one customer. He often sells KM, cake meal, in three bushel lots. The standard tow bag held three bushels. And that cake was then fed to cows and, and whatnot. The first local oil mill was established by Christian Metzger in the Hosensack Valley prior to 1767. It ran until 1812. Shortly thereafter, three more oil mills were in operation in that immediate vicinity. By the 1840s already, labor-intensive flat culture was in decline as cheaper cotton and linen goods could be purchased. With seed less available, Hosensack Miller, John Schantz, sent Conestoga wagons as far as Phillipsburg, picking up seed at various points according to a prearranged schedule. One bushel of flax seed weighed 56 pounds. Pressed with modern industrial methods, it yields two gallons of oil. With colonial methods, one bushel produced about one and a half gallons of oil. And mm -hmm. there's our, our schematic of drawing again uh, from that book. Um, there were quite a few oil mills. I'm just moving right along. In 1843, Miller Schantz purchased 1,148 bushels of seed from 73 accounts at prices ranging from $1.40 to $1.69 a bushel. Total expenditure was $1,732.90. That year, he sold 1,195 bushels of Lindmeal cake for $587.50 and 2,000 quarts of linseed oil for 1464.66. His net profit for the year was $319, which actually at that time wasn't bad. Uh, $319 was okay profit. For years thereafter, the mill managed to eke out a slim profit until in 1860, the mill was rebuilt with just two sets of grindstone, grist mill stones. Now they gave it up. By 1860, by the Civil War, this was all, all out of business. And when they went out of business, of course, the, the weaver went out of business because he had nothing to he had nothing to weave. If he wove the weaver, local weaver with flax and wool, uh, but mainly it was flax. And the village weaver, uh, when there was no flax uh, to weave, he, he was out of business. Or what they did, they some of the really good ones would actually weigh the hand weave coverlets. Which is astonishing if you think, if you know what a coverlet it is, how intricate and complicated it is to do that on a hand loom. On power looms, they were done with it's called jacquard loom. Uh, they were punch cards that told the sheds what to open, what to open, and what to close. But doing it by hand, boy, you could not daydream because you had to work those treadles as many as sixteen different harnesses, sixteen different treadles. And you had to work those in certain patterns 
to get your to get the pattern in the weave. It was a, a master weaver that could do that. The others, the, the non-master weavers, would weave uh, rag carpets or uh, haul runners and stair runners and things like that out of uh, rags and, and so on. But uh, yeah, when the, when the flax culture went, then the village weaver went too, more or less. It says, before I reached my teens, 60 years ago, this was written in 1927, so 1927 minus 60 years, we're talking 1867. I recall a patch of flax, it being pulled up roots and all, tied in bundles, hauled to the barn and beaten to crush the little seed vessels. Only one such crop is recalled. As I said, during the Civil War, uh, they did that again. I mean, they raised flax again because they didn't have cotton. As soon as the war was over, they had cotton and it was all, all gone. That was uh, Kreeble, editor of Propium Illusion Volume. Um, he was Schweinfelder. Dasenda. Okay. Well, while, while we're here, um, here's a nice uh, graphic I saw somewhere online. Um, the spool rack, the warping reel. Um, to express these looms on, on the uh, the shaft that held the warp thread, the warp thread went in with the weavers back there. The warp threads went forward, the wet threads went left and right. And they were in the shuttle that he sent back and forth. They were in the shuttle that he sent back and forth. Now, there might be, there might be a thousand threads on the, on the warp beam going through the heavens. And keeping that all straight and untangled was a weaver earned his pennies. But on the uh, the spool rack there on the right, in the background, you can barely somebody's winding spool, they're winding yarn on the spools. So from the spool rack there on the on the right, it went over to the warping reel, which is here. And then from there, the threads or the yarn, as it's called, went over to the warp beam. And then from there through the heddles back to the weaver. It's immensely complicated. And doing plain cloth, like a tablecloth or a sheet, was hard enough. But doing pattern cloth uh, was very complicated. Um, I mean, you couldn't daydream or else, it, well, you'll find mistakes in that. And many times in weaving, you'll see where, where there was a glitch. But um, the, the weaving was a real craft and a real trade. Only men were, men were weavers. Uh, they were not that, sure, there were somewhere in the world, but the, uh, there were women weaver, but weavers were men. And it was very low paying. Uh, but uh, when the flax went, then the weavers went. So that's my story. Yes, ma'am. So you can buy boiled linseed oil now and raw linseed oil. Yes. It's that. I don't know. The, yeah, linseed oil and raw linseed oil. I don't know what the difference is now. Right. But that is that. That's that. That's that. Well, they're not doing that now to make it. No. It's, a, it's an industrial product. They're growing flax somewhere in the world, in Canada or in the Western Midwest. They would be growing flax as a crop, and uh, they would be combining it with machinery and getting the seed, crushing it industrially, and and uh, getting um, two gallons of linseed oil per bushel. Incredible. Yeah. I think we've got five minutes. Any other questions, comments? I'll start. Is there any current use for the fiber? Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, the uh, fiber. Okay, he said. He said, was there any use for the fiber? Well, yeah, it's what you made flat, flat made linen out of. But now, a use for the fiber? Well, they still have linen, and linen is made from flax fiber. So my guess is there's an industrial process where they take the take the uh, the, the fiber and somehow manufacture linen out of it. I don't know. 
Long story short, I don't know. Yeah, it would seem like there's more seed needed nowadays than fiber. Yes. There may be more flax grown that's not used for fiber, but they do harvest. Yeah, for linseed oil. Linseed oil is a basic constituent of paint, mainly. Some flax can be grown with the linseed oil. Pacific Northwest and Oregon. Okay. Black seed grown for linen in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. Okay. You have a Bears Mill t shirt. Yeah, that's uh, I, I referenced that in, in, in the uh, presence. What was that? Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. 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 <laughs> uh, I'm sure it was hand done. There is no font. I'm, I have the book right here in front of me and looking at it. It is it's it's hand done and hand drawn, I think, by an artist. My guess too is it was hand done because this book was published in this book was published in 1958. So I'm sure in 1958 it wasn't a font, and the map was drawn by an artist, drawn by a Craig, you know. A Scrivener. Yes. That picture of the millstone that they're preparing. What do they do to prepare that for flax? For flax. What's for use? For use. Um, the question was, what did you do to a millstone to prepare it for use? How did you cut the grooves, as it were? Yeah. It was done by hand. Uh, grist mills, that is grain mills, uh, making flour. Um, the bottom bedstone and the top stone had grooves cut in. Those grooves were cut in by hand with something called a mill pick. Um, an itinerant craftsman would come around, you'd lift the top millstone off, flip it over so you could get to the grooves, and he would dress the stone which is cutting and sharpening those grooves. It was done by hand with a little steel pick. And um, that's how it was done. Um, so it was called dressing the, dressing the stone. And that's what was done. I don't know how often, uh, when, they were, when, a mill, when a millstone was running, um, they're probably not too often because the stones must not touch. An uh, incredible piece of machinery, a handmade, hand, basically a handmade mill by a millwright made by hand with ordinary carpenter's tools. That top millstone, which may weigh a ton or more, spun at over 100 RPM. And it had to go flat and true. It couldn't wobble. And the distance between the top runner and the bedstone was like the thickness of a thick piece of paper. And it couldn't touch where it would get hot and it couldn't be too loose or it wouldn't grind it fine enough. And that was all done by the millwright. I mean, basically started with a boulder and trees and ended up with the mill. Incredible, incredible craft. Yes. Guy who the yes. Also, um, up the surface, the lands, the yes. Yes. Yeah, rough. And put put little micro grooves in, in in there. It was a it was a skill and a craft to cut those right. And uh, depending upon which way it spun, you wanted to undercut them a little bit. So it made like a scissorsing action. Um, it wasn't just a matter of like having grooves in. They had to be shaped right. 
Um, so, yes. Uh, well, I don't know, did you ever hear of a Lucy Romero along the country near Green Lane? Uh, the, uh, it's just off Miami Road. The mill race is still there. The dam is gone. And the mill is gone. I was wondering if you encountered that. The last photograph that we have of record was the end of Schwartz. The mill was not on the 1888 It was on the 1860s listed as a Lucy Bell. It was no more. In, in the short, my short answer is, did I ever hear of it? No. But they, they, they quite likely it was there. There were oil mills all over. And what you said is quite, uh, the 1860 deed, it was there. By the 1880 deed, it was gone. Yes. The application of a mill. The mill right. Um, the miller ground the stuff. The millwright came around and made the wooden parts of the mill, the, the, all the wooden parts and the water wheel. Well, the first thing the miller did at the, in, every morning before he started, he'd go around and he'd hammer in the wedges. Everything was wedged. In, in, there were you know dozens, hundreds of wedges of everything. And he'd go around and tighten up the wedges. And uh, but the the miller and the millwright were different people. And the mill, like the millwright was actually more important than the miller. Well, the miller was the miller was a community leader. There were three main community leaders: the miller, the minister, and the tavern owner, the inn owner. They were the most respected people and usually the most wealthy people. Um. So, yes. <laughs> For the for the Zoom. Yes. Oh, yeah. Count Zinzendorf is a big name in Moravia. Okay. Let, let, let's uh, for the Zoom uh, viewers. Let's let's do that again more slowly. Near where? I have to repeat it. Where is it? Pittman, west of west of Pottsville, is a museum coming along of flax culture made by two brothers who are doing it because they have an interest and uh, they've written a thick book and it's the community where it is again is Pittman. Oh yeah. Yes. So it's kind of beautiful. Valley. Beautiful valley. Yes. Never heard of it. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. It's good. It's good. People are still into this, and it keeps it from disappearing entirely. Well, we're running on overtime here, so there we are. Any other questions, comments, observations need to be said? Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, very, very good audience. Nice, nice time as usual. Okay, thank you, Beth. There we are.